everybody. <laughs> What's How up, fungal associates? Welcome to Completely Arbitrary, the podcast about trees and other related topics. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Alex Croson. And of course, I am here with the indomitable AC Clap. Wow. The indefatigable. <laughs> uh, hi, hi Casey. Alex. Now, I noticed you. I noticed you skipped over my intro. Oh, you saying, that. are you okay, buddy? Yeah, because Alex, you should you should let everyone know that uh, they shouldn't get within ten feet <laughs> of you right don't now. Need... <laughs> and uh, I'm a I'm a wee I'm a wee bit sick, Case. That's right, and I yeah. am over at my house, not near you. Yes, you've got you've got frisbee to play. That's always what I think when I'm sick, and we don't we don't want to get together in person. I'm like. <laughs> I can't compromise his health. He's got Frisbee to play. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much for, <laughs> for thinking about that particular aspect. I actually would just think uh, I have other things to do, period. And, sure. Uh, but I, I do appreciate picking that one. I do, I do play Frisbee. In fact, I did it last weekend, and mm. I'm, very, I'm a little tired and sore from it. Oh, good. Or I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, or you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, case, but we're here. We, we, the show must go on. Yes, it must. And of course, you know, this show people, we got to talk about a tree. Yes, that's right. But Alex, hold on before we get too oh far. Oh my gosh. That, wow. Uh, we got to make sure that everyone knows that we are still accepting any kind of support they are willing to provide. Wow. Casey. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to help you out here Alex. Uh -huh. You're uh, you're a little fatigued, you're a little under the weather. Uh-huh. If you want I can take this part. Oh wow. Well, you know, if you take this part that I don't have much left. <laughs> this is all you have. <laughs> so let me just say <laughs> that this podcast is fueled entirely with Casey's and my blood, sweat, and tears, but also mm -hmm. our backup generator <laughs> that we are constantly running is the support of our lovely fungal associates. That's all you out there. That's right. You can go to arbitrarypod.supercast.com. It's A-R-B-O-R-T-R-A-R-Y pod and join the Casey 710 people. Wow. 710? God, yep. you guys are the best. You could make it 711. Wouldn't that be yeah. fun? That'd be way cool. And when we hit 7-Eleven, everybody gets a, fleece, a free slushy. <laughs> Everyone does. Everyone gets a free Slurpee, Alex. Slurpee. Oh yeah, your brands me. are way off here. It's not an icy. No, uh, it's, not, it's not an icy brand. Cool drink. <laughs> uh, yes, and on our, on our Supercast, you become a premium member. We have a couple different options there. You can get ad-free listening to the show, which is so mm -hmm. fun. Because who likes ads? No one. We try to make them fun, Casey, you know, but ultimately it's like polishing a turd. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. I I do know exactly what you mean. I cannot disagree there. <laughs> you can also get free bonus episodes. Of course, you're, you're paying for them. They're not really free. Mm. Uh, you can get video episodes. You can get, Casey, 20% off our merch store at all times. Yes, this isn't right. like Dang a it. one and done kind of deal. You anytime you order a piece of merch exactly. and you support the podcast, you get twenty percent off, and that includes mm. both the normal merch that we have, which includes a fabulous, fabulous tote bag, which everyone should go buy. We are not, we are not run out of those yet. Oh yeah, and at least three different styles of T-shirts. That's right. Plus, if you're a member of our Cone Club, mm. you can get into the Hidden Cone Store, wow. which is. Just chock full of all of the uh, the old cones that we've had, which I believe we're now at, uh, what, 43? This month, it will be our 43rd uh -huh. cone that we've K put out. Casey checked his watch. I'm very excited A about good it. bit yeah, of visual comedy that I had to... <laughs> Uh, that's right, Thank Casey. You. We've got we've have a veritable plethora, a, a conacopia, if you will. I will, yeah, I will. Of cone stickers that you get complete access to. So. If you follow us on Instagram and like two years ago, you saw a cone sticker that you were like, oh man, I really want that, but I just can't join the club right now. If you decide to join now, guess what? You can go snag that. It's no biggie. That's right. You can catch them all like Pokemon. 
Yeah, exactly. And we honestly, we highly encourage that you do. It's a it's a coveted collection, to say the least. So that's arbitrarypod.supercast.com. Support the podcast. Be cool. Uh, brag to your friends that you support an independent nature podcast. Yeah, seriously, because that is what gets you points. That's right. And if it doesn't get you a date, we'll give you uh, your money back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. That's yeah. Now. Yeah. Uh, no questions asked. Uh, yeah. Well, listen to the end of the episode for the disclaimer. Uh, Casey, uh, we must talk about a tree this week mm-hmm. and that tree. Wow, I was so I I and you know this when you told me this week's tree. Yeah. I literally said, "Wow." You did. You exclaimed out loud. I've never I, heard of this tree. You know what? I would be willing to bet most people haven't actually. Okay. And that's that's a part of the a part of the reason I wanted to cover this tree. This is a, an example of multiple things in my world kind of all coming together. Wow. And that this tree came out of, of that. How exciting Casey. Yeah. Let's uh, drop the ball in a new year's sense. We are talking the American <laughs> smoke tree. Uh, I love what you just said. Alex. Let's <laughs> drop the ball in the new year's sense. Cause the oh, other man. sense is, you know, bad. Yeah, it's like when I I've said before, like like you know you have an uphill battle, and then so when it's done, theoretically that would be downhill afterwards. Like so, I'm like, man, everything's downhill after this, and 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 I mean that in like a good way, where it's like there's no resistance. So yes, I feel you so hard. That's such a good. Let's drop the ball in a New Year's. So. Right, before we go to break, I just want to say one last thing about this tree, please. Uh, American smoke tree. And the mm-hmm. the scientific name is right out of a Gregorian chant. Ooh, please give us give us your version here. Cotinus obovatus. Ah, uh, that was so good, Alex. Why did why did I not know that you were like a closet Gregorian chanter? Why uh, why is this now just coming up? You can call me Greg from now on, Casey. <laughs> I, I shall, Greg. Uh, but we will talk a more, way more about this tree right after the break. We'll be right back with Completely Arbitrary. Welcome back to Completely Arbitrary. Today we're talking the American smoke tree, baby. That's right, man. Co- I'm assuming it's cottonous ob- Obov- obovatus yeah i think you got that right although okay. i preferred your gregarian chant uh um what did you say cotinus cotin co cotinus cotinus yes yeah yeah i like that better cotinus obovatus well that's usually what i'd call it alex i i guess i should say i really americanified it to be cotinus obovatus ew yeah that it is- sounds like you're pulling a booger out of your nose. It really does. That's that's bad, Casey. You can do better than that. <laughs> all right, all right. Cotunus ubuvatos. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's the tree we're talking casting about. Casting a magical spell. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I thought you were going to say initially. Uh, well, Casey, let's imagine, as we do every episode, that you and I, oh, wow, I guess we're walking somewhere in America, huh? Hey, there you go. Well done. And we come across some American smoke trees, Casey. Let's ID this tree. All right. So this is a tree that you will find very sparingly walking across the southeastern United States. Oh, wow. Essentially from like from like um, West Texas or kind of like central West Texas, which of course, you know, it's a giant state. So it's kind of down almost towards the panhandle on the bottom. Okay. Uh, is that what they call the panhandle or is a panhandle on the top? I believe the panhandle's on the top case. Oh, okay. Then this is the then this is the the, the Florida Peninsula that goes down into Mexico. That's where you're going to find one spot. Then you got to go way up to Oklahoma, over into Missouri and Arkansas. Wow. And then there's another kind of disjunct population over in uh, in the Alabama area. Yeah. And I'm, I'm seeing a little in Georgia. Yep. Just a little smack there, a little smack up in Tennessee. It yeah. really is like a very rare tree when you look at the distribution of it. Okay. And this is 
a tree that also has a, a, a few other relatives native to Europe and Asia. Mm. And there's one that probably everybody is very familiar with, which we call the smoke tree or the common smoke tree, which is Cotinus cajigria. Oh, wow. Now, this one is probably the one that you've seen a hundred times. It's the one that I have thought existed everywhere. And I didn't even know about the American smoke tree until I was doing research on this tree for writing my tree ID book here for the Pacific Northwest. Oh, wow. And of course, whenever I find a tree that I'm like, well, hold on, hold on. Is this tree around here? First, I question, you know, what do I know? And I go out and I look for it. And I found that, in fact, we do have the American smoke tree planted, not entirely uh, rarely, but, uh, you know, enough to be like, okay, yeah, there's one, there's two, and you can include it in a, in a kind of common book. Interesting. And it's kind of that for the rest of the world, really. So it's, it's a beautiful tree that does not get too tall. It stays around about 30 feet max, usually 25, 30 feet is what you'd mm. expect, but it can get up to apparently 56 feet tall and 32 feet wide. That's one measurement for what used to be the national champion, may still be a co-champion mm. over um, on the Purdue campus in Indiana. Interesting. It's a mo it's, it's pretty modest. It is. Tree. It's a it is. It's a modest tree in in its size and shape, and and it usually stays very rounded. Like it's got this kind of poofy, very round kind of. Um, it just looks like a a puffball on top of like a very stout stem. Well, Casey, you use that word very aptly because thank you. I will will hold off on describing the flowers, yeah. but. Puffball indeed. Yeah, I know. This is like puffs on puffs, right? It really is. Is that why they call it the smoke tree? It's exactly why they call it the smoke tree. Okay, okay, wonderful. Now let's just let's just skip to it. The, it they have they have leaves though, uh, and I'll just I'll just do a quick sidebar. Oh, the sure. leaves are what the name is about. Abovatus. It means literally oh. the opposite of an egg, or kind of like an upside down egg shape. Oh, sure. Okay. Whenever you uh, you hear that in botany, if the OB before something means it's the opposite of whatever the normal would be. <sighs> so if you say it's uh, ovatus, that would mean it has ovate leaves, which is, ovate means egg-shaped. Uh-huh. And then obovate means it is the opposite of that. So it's like an upside down egg. Okay. So an, an egg right side up is where the base is wider than the tip. Yes. So obovate the base of the leaf is going to be more narrow than the tip. Exactly. But still exactly. egg Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it looks kind of funny, but this one's a little bit longer than the European one. So it's more, more of a big, long oval than mm. it is like a perfect circle where the European one, it's almost, it's almost a perfect circle or kind of a squished circle. So a little bit oval like. It's a good looking leaf. It really is. And this leaf uh, is kind of like, fine most of the time it's just a mm. normal green color but after the flowers flower which i we can skip right over they are almost 100 percent pointless they they pop off on these really long six to ten inch panicles mm. so which a panicle of course is like one big inflorescence that has a very central stem with little stems that come off with little stems that come off of that so it's kind of like a compound uh racine they have little teeny tiny flowers like flowers that you don't even really like notice they're very very just pointless like they they, just, they don't see they, i don't want to say pointless because you know bugs go to them and insects they they like them the american but, smoke tree yeah pointless Frost? flowers yes alex they are pointless flowers they're very tiny the <sighs> flowers themselves they are maybe a millimeter or two across, I mean, Whoa. Kind of maybe a centimeter across. Okay. So they're pretty, they're pretty tiny. You're editorializing. Oh, it's like a millimeter across. Well, <laughs> you know, it's a, centimeter. Rah, 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 a little bit, a little bit. Rah, rah. Okay. About well, six okay. inches across. <laughs> okay. They are gigantic, <laughs> but they're still pointless. <laughs> they're still pointless. Just to be clear. <laughs> no, see, here's the thing, Alex, they have almost like the flowers themselves are, uh -huh. are not the thing that draws people to them. Along the the stems, all the little uh, the little peduncles and pedicels of uh -huh. the flowers, oh. there's these little teeny tiny hairs. Uh huh. Those little tiny hairs are like a pinkish purple color. 
Wow. And then as the, as the flowers kind of uh, turn into their little seeds, which they have these little flat, one seeded dry fruit that look, you know, again, completely unremarkable. They look kind of like the seeds of a, inside of a bell pepper or something like that. Okay. And they're attached to these, these stems on this panicle that are covered in these beautiful fine hairs. And all of those little tiny hairs become just beautiful and poofy. And that is exactly where it gets its name. You know what I think, Casey? What? I think these flowers Uh are using stolen valor. You think so? Because they're like, oh, look how I look at this photo. And the, and the the tree's like, oh, look how beautiful we are. They're like, oh, mm. the flowers are really beautiful. Yeah, yeah. We look a little closer. It's not flowers. It's pubescence. Exactly. Yeah, I, I completely agree. What I think a ripoff. Right. Although, I don't know if I would necessarily say stolen valor because it's all part of the same thing. You no. know, like they're all, they're all together. No? no? Okay. All right. Never mind. Take it back. <laughs> Wrong. So I think, Alex, I think that this is <laughs> this is more of a dogwood situation wow. where the flowers themselves took a backseat to another part taking taking the you know the lion's share of the attention. I see. Because in on dogwoods, of course, what we call the petals yeah. of the flower are are actually uh, Yeah, the bracts. Bracts. Yeah. Now, they're super beautiful. Don't get me wrong. So I also think that about the smoke tree. I think they're great in terms of like these puffiness that the the flowers, in quotes, which is actually the fruit, which is actually just a part of the infructescence, which wow. is really just actually a leftover inflorescence. <laughs> it, it's really this, you know, complicated trajectory. I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. You I, have I think to. It's beautiful. <laughs> Whatever it is. Whatever this, it is, I like it. If this is somebody's first episode of Completely Arbitrary, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Stick there around, are, please. <laughs> there are so many terms. You're using terms to describe terms to describe terms. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, everyone's going to have to buy a book about these terms, aren't they? Even me, the tree genius, it's taking <laughs> me a second to keep up. <laughs> it's true. Okay, well, sorry about that. Yeah, if it's taking you a second, I should slow down. <laughs> so you're saying, you're saying ultimately that the pubescence, the beautiful, yep. fine pink fur... Mm, is yeah. still a part of the flower, kind of. Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, this is a good point. I should I should give you a couple terms. So in fluorescence is the collection of all the flowers and the stems and and kind of bits that hold the flowers together. I say oh, stems yeah. flippantly, so just don't don't worry about that. The whole package. The whole package. Exactly. Now, an infructescence is mm. the same thing, but it is, instead of flowers, it's the fruit. Sure. So, this tree is in the Anacardiaceae family, which is the same one as poison oak and sumac. Oh, wow. And a lot of people, you you may recall, you'd be familiar with the staghorn sumac, those little shrubby tree things that we covered in our early succession mm-hmm. uh, episode. Yep. And they they have these tall flowers that bloom up in these really tight panicles, of course, very similar to our, our smoke tree. They're super tight. They look almost like um, a pile of kind of like red, red, I don't know. I, I want to say smoke, but that really wouldn't be a good description. <laughs> it looks almost like a mound of ochre clay kind of piled up into a very tall, wow. tight cone-like pyramid. All right. And that's what the flowers look like. And then the flowers turn into seeds and they look almost exactly the same. You can't tell Mm. the difference. And that is the greatest example I can think of um, to show like how an inflorescence seamlessly becomes an infructescence where it's a bunch of flowers collected together and then those each turn into their own fruit that are all collected together. And now the, you know, the name just changes from flor to fruk. Sure. Flora to fruka. Or I guess I just made that term up. But there you go. (laughs) Fruk meaning, you know, fruka. (laughs) <laughs> I love that. So, so yeah, it's but you can see very clearly how how closely related these are. But I think that the inflorescence, this whole collection, mm-hmm. is what makes it. Because if the if the individual little hairs, the pubescence, weren't there, the tree would look kind of boring. Everyone would be like, meh, moving on. Totally. Yeah. Okay. I I get you, Case. It's not it's not stolen valor. It's just another. It's it's like, uh, hey, the team did a really good job this week at the company, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No one can quite take 100% uh, credit. They can yes. just say the team. 
Right. And then one of the employees is like, yeah, I did a great job. Like, and then they have to be <laughs> yeah, corrected okay. by the boss and be like, no, the, t- the yeah. team did a really good job. The team, God. It's not wrong that you did a good job, but it, it is. <laughs> But it's more right that the team. Mm, yes, I, there you go. I think that's the best way to say it. <laughs> All right, let's move now, on. Now, let's move on. Let's get out of here. So here's the thing about this tree. So right now, as, as I wow. always say, I am in the midst of writing a tree ID book. What? And it is. It's true. I'm writing one. And you know what? Okay. Alex? Oh my God, here's a little bit. I'll share what? with you. What? Uh, what? What? Uh, what came up just the other day? So I was talking with the uh, yield publisher. Um, my oh, yeah. specific contact. Um. Her name is Emily, and she let me know that they went through the name and the official name, I believe, of this <gasps> book is going to be The Trees Around You, How to Identify Common Neighborhood Trees in the Pacific Northwest. Wow, The Trees Around You. Yeah, and you know what? That was my name. I came up with that. All right, Case. <laughs> So, wow, we have a title. We got a title, The Trees Around You, and hopefully everyone's going to be like, yeah, just go buy The Trees Around You. It'll tell you how to identify every tree around you. So I, I see that you didn't go with my pitch, uh, Who Can It Tree Now? <laughs> no, I, I'm i sorry. I didn't go with that. <laughs> that's that's for the best. Good oh, job. Well, there's a, we, we can use that for other things like as a part of this podcast, buddy. <laughs> True. The team did a really good job. <laughs> the team did a really good job. <laughs> Well, congrats, Case. Yeah, thank you. So while writing this book, I had to figure out what this tree was because I was looking up the normal European one. I'm like, there's just one. All of a sudden, the world was like, well, actually, there's two. Mm. So I had to figure out, okay, do we have it, one, and B, what are the differences? So I had to like go out and find one, and then inevitably... I found one that I had already found and taken pictures of, but just I thought it was a normal European species. And uh, then it turns out it wasn't. So I had to go back through my photos and like move ones around and say, no, 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 no. This one's actually a different Mm. species. And um, it's something that's happened multiple times while writing this book. I've learned so much about trees that I thought I knew a lot about. It turns out, no, I didn't. I knew about one and not like two or three others. So in this case, um, I was redoing the photos or looking at my photos and I was like, man, I really think this is a beautiful tree. Although I hate, I just hate the European one as a street tree Hmm. specifically. And so we had uh, done some trees that uh, I wasn't, you know, a super big fan of recently. And then afterwards, uh, like what, a couple weeks ago, you were like, hey, Casey, man, I'm glad we're doing a a tree that you really like. Cause you know, yeah. I'm just getting down talking all about these, these negative trees. <laughs> so I was initially going to suggest that we do the smoke tree, the European one, Cotinus Cajagria. Mm-hmm. And then I said, nay, nay, nay. There's another one that would be more interesting to look at. And I happened to be covering that in looking at the photo. So it was on my mind. And I'm also doing uh, tomorrow, which will be the day this comes out. So today, uh, a tour over at Hoyt Arboretum about wow. trees that are really lonely that I decided to call it lonesome trees. They changed it to uh, forest of one, which I, I think is a little bit better. Mm. I don't know if I agree. Ah, thank you, Alex. I'm glad to have someone on my side. Yeah. Either way, they're their own marketing team. They know what they're doing. Uh, mm. And as it works out. This is another tree that I'm going to cover because while doing some research, I realized that this tree, A, is so rare that it's kind of like almost borderline extinct. Whoa. And I was like, wait, wait, it's that rare? Like, why is that the case here? What what exactly happened in the tree's history to make it go almost extinct? Because there's no reason that, you know, it would be cut down it's not a big timber species there's not a whole lot going on with it in terms of like botany or or fruit like there's no there's nothing that screams this tree is of high value so people need to cut it down so i was like okay well it must be that this tree is um kind of a rare tree you'll recall the frank linea that grew only next to that the oh i forgot the name of that river anyway that was a little teeny tiny river down in the southeast i think in georgia Okay. And that's the only place that it grew. And right. then that ended up getting, you know, turned into farmland, got cut down. And now that the wild population is completely gone. So this tree, I was like, well, why, what is going on with it? And it's this teeny tiny little thing that grows only along 
what's called calcareous soils. Now wow. I have to say that, and it's very hard to say for me, and I don't know why, but it's calcareous soils, which looks like it would be pronounced the same as calcium. Yeah, so I was calcareous. Like, calcareous. Yeah, exactly. But then everything I found says it's calcareous soils. Okay. And that means that it's soils that are high in calcium carbonate. So essentially mm. they're filled with chalk or or lime and they're very alkaline. So they just like those soils for whatever reason. It, well, it sounds like it, or at least they can handle it. Oh. And there's just a few really dry places that are kind of these rocky, tough outcrops in those Ozark Plateau and the Edwards Plateau in Texas. Um, the Ozark is a little bit um, further to the east. Um, but they only grew on like these weird spots that just kind of popped out of nowhere and had really harsh soil conditions. And it just didn't seem like anything else wanted to grow there. So it seems to me that they might be trees that used to have um, a much bigger distribution. And when I say seems to me, I read about this, so I know that that's actually the case. <laughs> uh, but they used to, they found fossils of another species all the way up into like Alaska. Wow. So this used to be a tree that grew, or at least other species, all over the you, you know North America. There's others in Europe and Asia, about six or so other species. And so this one, I think, ended up essentially finding its way to a few teeny tiny spots while the rest of the world changed around it. And it just could not compete with any of these other trees that were growing bigger, stronger, faster, all that mm. other stuff. So it's only localized on these teeny tiny little populations where nothing else wants to grow. So it is a really adaptable tree. But basically, just gets out competed. So it's like, fine. Then I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be right here, and I don't care about you guys. Yeah. Now, the other thing about this tree, which I learned, and I was very curious about it. So I ended up going almost down a rabbit hole, and then I stopped myself because I was Ooh. like, Alex is gonna be upset if I do. A foxhole. Yeah. It very well put. It has a lot to do, actually, with wartime. Oh. <laughs> you know what? You're spot on. Sometimes it's just divine intervention. <laughs> you're just going to, I thought you were like, so, sometimes you just got to quit in your head. Uh, Thank you very much for listening to Completely <laughs> Arbitrary. I got that one right. I'm out of here. I'm going to, I'm going to George Costanza my way out of this episode. <laughs> End on a high. Quit the yeah, podcast. Very well, very well done. Very well uh, done. <laughs> okay. It has to do with wartime. Yes. So my favorite this, subject. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Casey. Uh, in fact, this is this is your favorite subject and your and and your favorite subject within the subject. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, trees um, and wartime. Exactly. Well, no, no, no. What what we're about to talk about? Oh, this, okay. This tree. You'll remember uh, where this tree is native to. Yeah. And in case you haven't, uh, it roughly is native to the kind of central regions of what about uh, let's see one. 160 years ago was known as the Confederate States of America. Ah. Now, the Confederate States of America uh, was a short-lived rebel state that uh, everyone, of course, knows about because of the American Civil War. So this tree apparently was already growing in kind of these, these isolated populations. It was not a forest tree. It's not a tree that you can just find popping up everywhere. Then in the Civil War, they ended up cutting it down at a ridiculous pace. Wow. Strictly to use the center wood, the heartwood, as a yellow dye. A yellow dye. A yellow dye. A, a six-sided block of wood which you roll. Exactly, because that okay. was probably the most important thing they needed at the time for the war effort. Yellow dye? <laughs> no, dye, Alex, as in the coloring agent. <laughs> I can't believe it, you guys. This is a real reaction. Alex legitimately did not think I was talking about colored dye, as in tie dye. He can't okay. even talk right now. <laughs> My first... <laughs> My first thought was like, ah, you know, war is boring. You know, these soldiers got to entertain themselves by, you know, playing playing craps out in the field. <laughs> oh, I can't believe that. That's so good. I you genuinely. Are such a, you're such a gamer. 
<laughs> you genuinely thought this was like a a a dice. <laughs> yes, yes. I thought they were making dice with the wood of this tree. This truly makes my day. <laughs> wow. Okay, so so no, uh, they were making so a DYE. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for their uh for their bandanas and such. Exactly. No, actually, not even the bandanas. Wow. It is a very specific thing where the color yellow actually signified that you were in the Calvary. Oh, Casey, I have to, I have to oh, correct you, my friend. What? Calvary is like the church. Cav Cav cavalry. Cavalry? What? Are, what? Am I this differently? Whole, yeah. You said the word Calvary. Oh, I did. Which is uh, like a, something to do with the church. Cav cavalry. Cavalry. Is horsed, wow. horsed, uh, horsed uh, soldiers. This is, this is something I have never known about myself, and I have probably <laughs> said so wrong so many times. I cavalry. only know because I've been there, you know. Wow, Calvary. I think I always say Calvary. Yeah, you're wrong. No, no, I must not. <laughs> cavalry. It is cavalry. Jeez, okay. I'm going to make sure to get this right. I'm going to stare at this word. Cavalry. There we Good. go. There, yeah. You've locked it in. God. So so a yellow a <sighs> yellow, uh, a yellow, fabric of some kind would show that you were in the cavalry. Yes, exactly. It would show that you were a horse rider. Okay. Now, this also was needed for other parts, specifically anything that was like a gold star or like um, a gold bar, something like that. Oh, sure. Those also had yellow dye that was needed. And there's also this thing that I learned about that the soldiers had, and they're, they're called knots. They're called Austrian hmm. knots, which I, I didn't really know about, but they're kind of interesting. They are these like very like in intricate kind of braided patterns wow. that they wore along their sleeves. And this is something that is uh, very much important through um, the old like European armies where this was in the 1800s, probably back to the 1700s. They had these really intricate knotted like lace or um, otherwise braided patterns along their arms. And okay. it kind of, in, it was an insignia that, you know, basically said fancy and important and things like that. Oh, okay. And it turns out that in the, um, in the U.S. Civil War, the guy that initially did the, uh, the flag, like he designed the flag and a bunch of their uniforms, he was very much into old Austrian stuff. He was a German-born mm. um, uh, German immigrant, and so he took a lot of his inspiration from French and German armies. So you can actually find a bunch of very interesting um, patterns that kind of go back and forth between the two because they had the same kind of... Uh, the same kind of inspiration way back when. For and this sure. Is way back in the in the 1700s. So there's no. Uh, this is this is way back when it was like the the old fashioned um, armies where it was like the Napoleonic times where they mm -hmm. had mostly um, nothing was camouflaged or anything like that. It was all supposed to be very bright and flashy, like. Um, historically, like in World War One, some of the the armies had these these really amazingly intricate, like kind of dress uh, dress fatigues. And only later, after World War One, did we basically do away with that and say we don't need everyone to look like peacocks out there. We actually need them to look a little bit different. Um, that's so that's the stuff that I would call livery, like the uh, like really fancy, like. Yeah, We're going okay. to war. Look your best. Yeah, precisely. It's such like it's such a weird thing because I can remember this. Like it almost feels like something from you know like a, a Game of Thrones or yeah. anything from any other history in in the history of the world. Like in the history of warfare, you would like look your best and look fancy and look intense and like mm -hmm. have all your dress regalia on in order to go fight a real battle, whether or yeah. not that was like actually helping you win <laughs> so it's very interesting and it only changed like in the last 100 years and now everything is like you know straight camouflage and like very utility for the purpose of fighting rather than looking intense and beautiful and fancy while you're fighting this tree 
if you cut into the wood, it's very, very bright, gorgeous, beautiful yellow. Wow, that's Amer- That's amazing. I almost said yeah, that's America. You, yeah, that's America. <laughs> have you uh, have you ever looked this up? No, I'm doing it right now. Oh yes, please, please, please. It is. Uh, <clears throat> wow. It's, it, you can look up the um, the native are American that we're talking about, or you can look up the um, the European called Tinus Kajigria. and the wood has this like really intensely kind of layered orange brown mm-hmm. mixed with yellow, and then back again and back and forth and back again. And I remember cutting one of these years ago while working for the city because it had um, snapped in half or something happened that I was like, wow, well, this tree's done. So I ended up cutting a big branch off of it and I looked at the cut and I'm like, oh my God, like it is a stunning, beautiful yellow, uh, like dark, very intense yellow color. looks very bronze to me. Yeah, it was really stunning. And so while I was doing research and, and found out that this tree was cut down a whole lot, and the reason why was for these very specific uniform things, mm. which you can think, whenever you think of like, um, you know, a general or, a, you know, some kind of officer, the insignia that's very bright in yellow, the gold stars, like they're important. They really show off that high class mm. of the officer. So it is, it makes total sense that they would use this tree that they had because there was also like blockades. It was hard for um, the South to get things in. So they had to use the wood that they had in their own area to make these dyes. And they almost cut them literally to extinction, which blows my mind. So I think most of the reason these trees are still here is because they sprouted back. And Casey, this is not the first time that a southeastern tree has been cut down to near extinction mm-hmm. for the purposes of war. I'm yes. of course thinking of the li- the southern live oak. Exactly. We have no more ancient <clears throat> gigantic live oaks because they were always used for building ships. That's right. Wow. Well, god, was it worth it? Yeah, you know, I I suppose at the time they'd probably say 100% yes. So it's hard to it's hard to look back, but well, sure, at least they, the trees they are still say. there. <laughs> they would say. Would we say? I don't know. Probably not. Yeah, but, probably not. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to look back on those things and be like, well, if you didn't do that, how would the world be different? That sure. Interesting counterfactuals to play with, right? Of course. I don't think either of us are uh, educated enough to even attempt it, but you no. know, it's it's fun to think about. It is. It's fun um, to think about. And that's what I think we're here for. <laughs> aren't there, Casey, aren't there other examples like <clears throat> you're in Europe, like the Roman uh, Empire, uh, like yeah. laying siege to forests for like building trebuchets and shit? Oh, yeah. I mean, the the cedars, the cedar of Lebanon, historically was cut down for building ships and things like that, mm. almost to the point where they lost all of those trees. And wow. we could probably um, look at almost any Southern European tree or trees in North Africa, wherever this all these old ancient civilizations were that had like really big impacts on their environments. And so mostly we know about the ones in... Uh, the Middle East and the Mediterranean, kind of the the Mesopotamia area. And then over in the Far East, it definitely happened a lot with trees in uh, China and Japan, but they were very focused on regrowing a lot of their trees. Mm. And I don't want to, I don't want to say that, you know, anyone is better or perfect, but there has been problems on all sides. You cut down a bunch of trees, you end up getting environmental damage. But some places were very, very intent on growing those trees back because they realized, oh, if we just keep cutting these down, we're not going to have any more. Wow. Whereas um, in in this area, you know, or in the, the Middle East, they had a huge amount of resources and they just kind of used them all. And then a lot of times they ended up turning that land into new farm fields or something like that. Or, of course, they became cities half the time too. Sure. So... It, I think, Alex, that it's probably happened more often than we know. And it might even happen to the point where we actually don't even know what species maybe were cut down because they all look the same. They totally. Cut them all down. And now only the the big popular ones that we know of have grown back or were planted. So it's a similar thing with uh, the rainforest. Cut it all down. You never know what you lost. You know? Sure. Yeah. And I, I also imagine that in terms of record keeping during a war. Yeah. 
uh, the species of tree cut down to build the <laughs> ship is probably low on the priority list. You know? Yeah, and and I don't think they had as many botanists to really focus on it to be <laughs> like, well, <"Hey>, technically, <laughs> this is a different species than this one. <clears throat> That's true. <clears throat> That's true. Yeah. Well, so this, uh, speaking of botanists, this one was actually first um, identified by uh, Europeans, so for Western science, in like 1819, 1818. Mm. So it was not not too long before the Civil War happened. But also, we've only known about this tree for about 200 years in terms of uh, Western science comparing it to the one that we've known from Europe. Surely the native peoples in this area have used this for dyes for a million different things. And my guess, Alex, if I was a betting man, is that those people initially were using this tree for dyes for all sorts of different things. And then that was co-opted only later by the settlers who came in and changed everything. It's a, it's a safe bet case. Yeah. But so this is a, this, the last like big thing that I thought was really interesting about this tree. So mm. I, I, one thing I, I noted is that there is a, uh, it had all these different intersections. So my Hoyt Arboretum tour, the, the lonesome trees, this is a very, very lonesome tree. Then the fact that it's exactly on my mind because I covered the covered it um, in terms of pictures just yesterday and just today when I went out to find uh, that same species and check on it and get a couple more photos. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, it also is called the smoke tree. And we just got today, Alex, um, our first – well, actually, I can't even say that, but we got a little bit about uh, of, a bout of rain this morning. Yes, oh, Casey. Just a little bit. And last week we had a really bad week filled with smoke in the the Portland area. Mm -hmm. And my when I was writing this up, I was actually going to do this next week, and I decided to move it forward. Mm. And I had written as the description the smoke that we want to see. Nice, because this is this tree is called a smoke tree, and about this time of year, it starts putting out. Right, I got it. Big <laughs> thing, yeah, yeah. Okay, Alex, let me explain. <laughs> It's an inflorescence, <laughs> but it's also an infructescence. It's a yellow dye. <laughs> Go ahead. So yeah, I thought that this would be uh, this is the, the a kind of tree that would be fun to to cover during this moment where you know we're barely getting out of um, our our big fire season where yeah. smoke is everywhere all the time. Boise has been inundated for probably weeks and months now. Blah. And now there's like this is one tree that's kind of like oh man. I wish I could just see the smoke tree instead of trees <laughs> smoking. <laughs> and I was like, man, I just want to think about that for a second. I decided, you know what, Casey, you can turn that into an entire episode. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how the sausage is made, people. This is how the sausage is it's made. as easy Here as that. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine you sitting on your porch with your, with your Meerschaum clay pipe <laughs> going, hmm. I would rather see a smoke tree than a tree smoking. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. I shall write it in my journal. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah, so great anyway, idea, Casey. So that's where it came from. Then it turns out it just kept intersecting everywhere else. And I was like, I got to do it this week. We got to cover it right now. I think it's a, a great one. And you you know how to tickle my fancy with a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of historical context. Hey, there you go. I love that. Now, I should add one one other thing. I was going to do a tree that uh, we're going to do it next week. So don't, wow. don't, I mean, you should look forward to it. But in your state, I was like, man, Alex doesn't want to hear me go off about like the, the biogeography of Szechuan province, China. <laughs> Not quite, Case. <laughs> so maybe I'll, maybe I'll like <laughs> wait to talk about that in agroforestry until he's feeling a little bit more energy. Uh, <laughs> and I can just regale a fun story about a fun tree today and see, see if we wow. can lift his spirits. I appreciate your uh, self-awareness. That's, that's <laughs> I, yeah, lovely. Okay. <laughs> I have you in my heart all the time. Likewise, Case. And you know what else I have in my heart? A rating for this tree, Casey. Ooh, he already has it. And we're going we're gonna to do it, but we're going to do it after a break. And we will be right back with the, with the con exciting conclusion of the American Smoke Tree right after this. Welcome back. To Completely Arbitrary, that was our discussion of the American Smoke Tree. It's time for a review. Wow, Casey. Yep, it's already here. Here's how it works. We're going to give some final thoughts on the tree and then give it a rating of 0 to 10. Yellow cones of honor. 
Wow. Not even golden this time. Just a normal, <laughs> normal yellow. Casey, as our resident expert, we'll begin with you. All righty. So this little tree, I think, has just made my, it's just made my day. Wow. And it's made my day for a kind of, uh, I don't know, a particular reason. So I, I made a quick mention that I do not like the other tree. the European smoke tree? European smoke tree. It just doesn't hit the same, you know what I mean? It is planted more often. There's this big purple variety that everyone loves, and it is the worst looking tree. Wow. It, it grows up and kind of becomes a poof, and then it sends up these long shoots that just like shoot up out from the, the center of the canopy and then have this puff of, of foliage on top. And it just looks stringy and leggy and awful. It just has nothing, in my mm. opinion, that makes it like a really nice, beautiful tree. Unless you like keep it as a nice little shrub and you you prune it down. The green version is way better in terms of form than the purple version, but the purple version is what everyone wants, and so that's the one that gets planted. Mm. So it's just this really ugly tree, and some people uh, in certain locations have been like, hey, this is actually a really good small-sized street tree that we can plant in little tiny planter strips. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'll give you that. But man, is there any other better options that we can plant? Then I stumbled across this one particular tree. And I was like, now this is a beautiful smoke tree. Mm. Not five seconds later did I learn that there is this second species, which is the American smoke tree, which is an actual tree. And it looks like a tree and it grows like a tree. And it has a big, beautiful tree form that does not get leggy and poofy and shitty. Yeah. So it is the savior of this species. And there's a great wow. picture on, uh, right, I should say the savior of the genus for me. Thank you. Um, there's a great picture on the Oregon State Landscape Plants that shows the, the habit in fall between the two. There's the our main species on the left with this gorgeous, beautiful fall color, which we didn't even talk about. This thing is like fire in the fall. And then directly next to it is the European one that just looks like, awful i just hate it i just don't like it and i'm like now that's the perfect example of why one is good and the other sucks you mean fire so, in the in the gen alpha sense that tree is I actually, fire i actually mean it in both regards that was a double <laughs> entendre sir. that's right that's right yeah so it is um it's just one of the most beautiful trees and it stays small it's super tough and it also like gets big so it has a really thick trunk that gets like a foot in diameter mm. while the top kind of stays small and circular so it looks like this big kind of like almost bonsai-esque tree where it's like i'm really big and stout but i'm not that tall i just kind of hang mm. out so i'm gonna give this an 8.0 straight down the middle all right I just think that it is it, it redeemed an entire genus for me it looks beautiful it's about to go off because of the fall color it's just mm -hmm. around the corner and it also is this perfectly formed species that you can plant in small little spaces and it's not going to be obtrusive and it's going to have a form that you're just like mm, yes <laughs> 8.0 so, yellow cones of honor yeah in fact i'm gonna go 8.1 i'm just excited about it oh it's wow case all um, right yeah, yeah don't give don't give me any more time it's gonna keep going up <laughs> all right well I'll, I'll give my review then i think you said it you know like this tree it's manageably large it's mm. it, it, i think you would describe it probably as a medium-sized tree right Small, Actually, to, small I, to medium. I would say small to medium. Yeah, that sounds okay. about right. Okay, but you look at it and it's not scraggly, mm -hmm. and it's it's not thin and weak looking. Yeah, it's like a proper tree, and I think I would describe it as tastefully small. You know, mm, yes, yes. And I, I like what you said, bonsai. It almost looks like a it, just a scaled down big tree. Yeah, um, exactly. It looks story. It's an old soul. You know. Oh, that's nice. Uh, I really love the colors, Casey. I can't get enough. And I love, <clears throat> it's got that sort of optical illusion flower. That's mm -hmm. like, it looks kind of fuzzy and like haze, like fuzzy as in like out of focus, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agreed. In fact, as one who's taking photos for a book, 
I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> you had to check them later and be like, yeah. is this out of focus? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the fall colors, boy, oh boy, give me some of that. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Everything I've read, Alex, has been mm-hmm. like, this is the most top best of all. Wow. Well, Casey, I'm feeling 7.75 7. for the 7. American smoke point tree. Seven five. I think it's fabulous. Well, that I, is what I'm talking about. You know, for a tree, especially for a tree that I did not know existed until today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good score. I absolutely agree, especially because it's like a tiny little tree. Like yeah. it's it's unknown to most people, including me, until just moments ago. Yeah, it's like socially tiny. It like takes yeah. up this little pocket of of the grand stage of world botany, mm-hmm. but it does what it does really well. Sure does, and that's what's important. That's, that's what's, what's important. important about a tree. That's right. It is the it's the Leslie Nope of trees, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it, super funny. It's uh-huh. uh, it, yeah. it is very very dedicated to what it does, which yes. is run a parks and recreation department. Even though what it does ultimately is not, the stakes are not that high, you know? Yes. Uh, Perfect. I'm talking Perfect. season one, Leslie. Not, not <laughs> Okay, thank you. When she becomes I always, president. I always think about season two. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was our review of the American Smoke Tree. Let's light one up for our homies, Casey. <laughs> and move on. All right. To our completely arbitrary AMA. And if you have a question for the podcast, become a Tremium member and click over to that AMA tab and ask away. And that happens at arbitrarypod.supercast.com. Casey. What do we got today, Alex? This week's question comes from Mike. Hi, Mike. Mike. Is that a pseudonym? <laughs> it's an acronym, actually. Mm. It's actually a homonym. This, is, this was written by a microphone. What? Oh it's God. true. And AI we, is taking over. And we are speaking into microphones. This goes along with our whole uh, our whole cavalry, cavalry, die, die thing. Cavalry. Mike says, I'm gonna I'm just gonna read the whole thing because it is a long paragraph. Mm, okay. But he kind of like uh he kind of soft pitches into the question. Ah, uh, okay, There's gotcha. Not a real good place to start. All right, so, let's do it. Striped Maple was a wonderful episode. Thanks, Mike. Stop, Mike. Thank you a million times. It was exciting to hear that Casey has a dream I had to start a nursery in Arboretum. Nice. I've settled for growing trees from seed in pots on my deck and planting them across the street in the landscaping Mm -hmm. around the water tower. Okay. Mike says, I've planted about as many as there's room for. Two Northern Catalpa, Eastern Red Bud, Red Bud. Speaking of smoke tree, yeah. uh, Amer Machia. Amer Machia, absolutely. Yeah. What a beautiful tree. Dwarf Siberian pine. I transplanted an American hornbeam seedling from my yard, but it didn't come until didn't come back after winter. Oh, it's too bad. Mm. I had plans to rewild the hill in my backyard, but I've gotten nearly enough seeds to germinate and survive. But I've not oh, but gotten you, yeah, enough okay, seeds. Yeah. Which finally brings me to my question. Here we go. Mm. What are your thoughts on rewilding urban areas and yards with tiny forests? Oh, my God. Okay. Thanks so much for the show. I love your enthusiastic curiosity and ability to learn and convey so much as a teacher-student pair. Genius. Gosh, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. Well, see, this is the thing, Alex. Is The Mm -hmm. answer is obviously, and everyone knows, 100% in favor of. Sure, yeah. That is actually um, something we, uh, what, I guess next week we're going to debut a partnership that we have with um, a, a company that is doing exactly this across the world, which is yeah. super exciting. It's called Planet Wild. Planet Wild. It's called the, yeah, it's called Planet Wild. That's and right. So that is uh, when I got advertisements for it and I was stoked. And then they reached out to us and we're like, oh, absolutely. So mm-hmm. it works out in all favors and basically what they do and what you're doing is taking areas that have historically been, uh, you know, I don't know, quote, modernized, developed, like turned into anything other than their kind of natural native habitat, more natural, I should say. And that is just so important in this day and age where, um, I think that every spot of land that could be turned into something that is, 
supporting anything other than humans is probably a really important thing to do because mm. we've taken up so much space yeah. on this planet. There needs to be spaces for other things that want to live in this world also and that we want to live next to us and that should have the opportunity. And I think rewilding <laughs> land is is exactly what we need. Here's the thing, Case. I agree with you. But there's a big asterisk next oh, to my yeah, answer. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And that is as long as you know what you're doing. Yeah, okay. All right. That's fair. Yeah. I think it must be done with purpose and knowledge and uh -huh. planning. Yeah, because, well, intent. Yes, intent. Yeah, intentions. Because I fear the person who's like, I don't like that empty lot next to my house. I'm going to go plant this seed I found. And that seed is a tree uh, of heaven. Yes, I see. Yeah. And suddenly they're taking over the neighborhood and everybody's pissed off. Yeah, there you go. So I think I think like the idea is very romantic, you know? Yeah. But, but I like think five a, seconds of homework. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it requires, uh, I think it's a bit of a slippery slope and maybe requires some, uh, s some forethought and planning. And maybe like, yeah maybe a, an organization who has a team of people who can, you know, do this. Although yeah. I'm not, I'm not opposed to gorilla planting like Mike is doing. I'm not going to mm. call the, the tree police on you, <laughs> um, which is just Casey, by the way. Uh, yeah, it uh, really is. <laughs> He's come out, pull my baton and beat that sapling to death. <laughs> and yes, a cab, even Casey. <laughs> a cab includes Casey. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I maybe am like, who care, who, who careful there, make sure you, you, uh -huh. you know what you're doing and the, the, the local environment, the habitat's going to appreciate it. Yes. Alex, I think that's a really, really, really good point is you, it, it is easy to go wrong because the things that grow easily are often the ones that are invasive. Yeah. So, but it does sound like, um, according to the species profiles that Mike has uh, <laughs> let us know about, that's exactly what is right. I mean, totally. some of those are non-native species, but they're not invasive. They're just I, ornamental trees. I want to clarify. Others, I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, accusing Mike of of not knowing what he's oh, doing. No, 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 just, no, no, no. I think you're just adding that. Yes. Like, yeah. To the conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I. Yeah. Yeah. I th I'm on the same page as you. Hundred percent. Cool. Um, but I think that that is, um, I think it's really, really important and positive thing um, because um, I actually, I thought about this in um, the city of Detroit many years mm. ago. Do you remember? It's like the only city that's declared bankruptcy yes. in the United States. It was mm -hmm. a huge deal. And The premise it, of RoboCop 2. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> that's true. Uh, well, so Detroit is like this... Um, this this huge city it was like bigger than chicago in terms mm. of like size and culture for a long time and then after like things uh, manufacturing away car dealerships and their car manufacturing all that kind of stuff it all it kind of became this this community that was atrophying motor and, city right case yeah exactly right so uh, years later, it, they basically said, we've run out of money. We have all these vacant lots. I have two friends that bought a house there like probably 10 years ago. They've since moved back to Portland, mm. but they bought a house in like for like $40,000, like some crazy am amount of money for what you'd expect. Wow. And it's like, well, because the markets just dropped out on this city. And so I thought to myself while this was all happening, I was in college and I was kind of thinking through the world and I was like, man why do we need to have this be a city still? Like, why can't we take this city that is atrophying and slowly but surely losing different things and buildings are falling down and places are kind of going defunct, people are moving away. Why don't we just, just bulldoze these houses and turn it back into a farm or a forest or something like that? Like, Give it back to nature. Exactly. Or just reuse it for something that is not what we humans call progress, you know, where you have a forest and you cut it down for a farm, then you develop that farm into a suburb, then you develop that suburb into a more urban area with high rise houses and closer development. And then you get a downtown, you know, and it's like that's the, the trajectory. That's the linear progression of positive progress. Hmm. And I just don't think that has to be the case. And I think rewilding is that kind of happening in real life where people are like, you know what? No, this vacant lot does not need to stay vacant because it, it needs to, it cannot go quote backwards. I yeah. think that we can just turn it back into a forest and in the minimum, we can remove those trees and put something else there if we need housing or something like that. Do I always want that? No, I really do not. But 
if that is an opportunity, then I think what Mike is doing and what rewilding is kind of all about is a super positive step. And I think that should be seen as progress also. It's just not a linear progress in the same way that we've always imagined it as humans, where we've said, oh, well, this is what it must be. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right there, Case. I hate, man, I hate to be the skeptic, you know. Mm-hmm. But can I can I can I just play devil's advocate for a second yeah. and, and just yeah, yeah. ask a question that skews negative? Uh-huh. Is it too late? Like, uh, you know, is is that a romantic mm. is that a romantic idea? Is that idealistic and impossible? Like, isn't it isn't it just too late for that kind of shit? You know, I I don't think so. Okay. And the reason the reason why is that we we can do that in a city where we can just basically imagine turning everything into micro parks. Like it's not rewilding so that you have this, you know, perfectly untouched intact ecosystem the way you have out in, you know, parks or national forests or things like that. It's more of an idea of um bring back some native species and bring back some ecosystems that can just kind of do their own thing. It's kind of holistic, right? It's like, let it take care of itself. We're just giving it the tools to do so. Yeah. Or like, instead of having a vacant lot, you know, where there's a lawn that needs to be mowed, turn it into a prairie, Uh, Mm. plant a bunch of native wildflowers. And then you can have, say, monarch butterflies come visit your neighborhood Mm. because Mm. you planted a whole trove of milkweeds. Um, And then like, there's a guy that I follow on Instagram. It's a native habitat project and he's based out of Alabama. And he is just harping all the time on the fact that grasslands are really important, beautiful ecosystems. Mm. And that guy can identify more native wildflower species than I've ever seen in my entire life. Now he's particular to his little zone, which is just Alabama. And it just goes to show that if everyone had someone like that, every state could be filled with, you know, a billion wildflowers. And he brings up all these things like protect these native ecosystems because they're important and they're beautiful. And they also are these basis of so many other things. First, you have their insects, then you have birds, then you have mammals. Like they're a really fundamental part. So I think rewilding, Alex, to get back to your question, is not so much let's turn this into, you know, the, take the entire neighborhood and turn it into a prairie. It's more just like, okay, right there, we can plant a tree and that tree can support something and we can underneath it produ- produce a bunch of wildflowers. And we can just make this little spot. Sure. So instead of having this, um, this, this binary of native natural versus, you know, mm. unnatural, you know, unnative or so to speak. It's more of, hey, yeah, inside of our city, it looks a lot like what used to be here in this point over there and right here. And it just creates this little patchwork of of things that are a little bit nicer than gravel. I got you. It's not all or nothing. It's like, well, we have a we have a square block. We, we don't have to turn it into a Popeye's chicken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know what? Maybe if it's going to be a Popeye's sometime in the future, why don't we, in the meantime, make it a wildflower garden? Sure. So that's, uh, that's, that's better than I'm a at. big plot of dust. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it benefits everybody. I think it's way nicer to walk by. It looks <clears throat> beautiful. And totally. at the end of the day, you can look at it and see butterflies and you can have kids sitting and read books. You know, you can have squirrels run around and, and chill. But I will say, I love that chicken from Popeyes. Oh God! All right, right. that's fair. It's true. It is Louisiana fast. (laughs) Thanks, Mike, again for your question. If you've got a question for the podcast, become a premium member and support this podcast that you love so much. Again, that's arbitrarypod.supercast.com. And hey, while you're at it, hop over. I'm going to go there right now to arbitrarypod. A R B O R. T R A R Y pod.com slash merch. And when mm-hmm. you land on that webpage, you're going to see, oh, arbitrary tote bag. What? That's exciting. Oh, there's a picture I of, love of Casey wearing one in a practical way and for scale. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you see, flaunt your fungal pride with a 12 ounce black cotton canvas tote featuring art by Tori Gorham and printed by Icon Artistry in Portland, Oregon. And you can rep your favorite pod and support it at the same time. What could be better? 
Yeah. And you know what I realized? I don't know if we've ever huh. really hit on this as much. Um, it, the, the packaging that we use particularly is 100% compostable, recyclable, burnable. It, it's all just recycled newspaper. That's right. And yeah. I, I don't know if we've ever like said that since like day one, but <laughs> True. we don't use, we don't use any plastic in, in what we send. Yeah. So, Everything you can literally take it and put it directly into your garden. It's just used newspaper. Yeah, it's we've we've really thought it through, Case. That's right. That's right. So you get what you pay for. Yep, sure do. Casey, clap. Alex Croson, thanks for sitting down, even though you're uh, feeling a little under the weather here. I gotta say this, Case. Whenever I don't feel like doing the pod, and then I say, you know what, let's just fucking do it. I always feel a little bit better after we're done. There you go. And that then the next time, the next time I don't want to do it, I forget the sentiment and I'm like, yeah. no, I don't want to do it. And you have to remind me, it'll be fun. It then, will be. Yeah. And it is. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, this sounds a little bit like addiction. We're like, no, I never want to do it. And then I, then your friend <laughs> Lisa's like, come on, man, just one more. Come on, let's just do one more this week. And then you always enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this episode of Completely Arbitrary. And thanks for always listening to episodes of Completely Arbitrary. And we will see you on the next one. Goodbye. See you later. Completely Arbitrary is produced by Alex Croson and Casey Clapp. Our artwork is by Jillian Barthold, and our music is by Aves and the Mini Vandals. If you want to support this podcast and become a Tremium member, head over to arbitrarypod.supercast.com. Thanks for listening.